my name is Jonathan Avila, and I wanted to thank you all very much for coming out to this talk. Uh, I will be talking about medical VR, uh, doing a quick industry analysis in addition to different applications that are currently out there in uh, the United States. And I will be using a case study, which is uh, our own company, Core Simulations. And uh, I, I'm also a co-founder at Core Simulations. So the AR and VR healthcare industry is, is very interesting because it is kind of projected to be one of the most fertile and rapidly growing industries within the uh, just AR applications for enterprise. Um, however, that's without saying that AR, or AR and VR applications for healthcare have a lot of hurdles to get through. And I'll, I'll highlight some of those hurdles uh, throughout the talk. So 17.8%, so the VR AR industry is expected to grow by 17.8% in the next five years. In addition, if you were to combine the two industries together, uh, you have a $1.45 billion by 2020, which is projected by the immersive media state of, uh, the state of VR industry. VR also has a lot of very great benefits just to the human experience and also for patients. For example, uh, if an individual uses uh, virtual reality with their treatment, you can reduce general uh, clinical anxiety by 63% within patients. In addition, you can reduce pain, which is uh, highlighted by um, uh, some pain management, what's called case studies uh, that I've referenced. You can reduce it by 24% within as little as 20 minutes of trying on virtual reality. What this means is that these are strong indicators that VR can have a big play within the healthcare industry. And that is why uh, we as a team, Core Simulations, has decided to pursue it for VR therapy. So some examples for VR in healthcare. Um, you have surgical assistance, uh, which is very similar to the concept where you have a physician who wears a VR headset and controls some form of robotic arm to do surgery for patients. You also have remote diagnostic, which is an area that we're very interested in, where you can do what's called at-home therapy for patients, where you can give patients a headset where they can then log data, which will be sent to physicians. And uh, based on market research, that is kind of where healthcare is going at this point. Uh, phobia treatment, which is uh, pretty common within the VR industry, to where you can cure people from facing or from fears by actually putting them there to actually face it. Uh, I've seen multiple companies do this, and multiple companies be very good at it. Um, you have the phantom limb uh, PLP treatment, which is basically if someone gets an amputated arm, you can actually simulate the kind of sensations of an arm utilizing virtual reality. Robotic surgery is in close line with surgical assistance, and data visualization is relatively new within the healthcare industry uh, to where physicians can now actually perceive data provided by their patients in VR. And it's kind of a new way to see where, you're, where your patient's at and who you're treating. Um, skills training for physicians, and this is also in, re in relation to uh, surgery. So they are actually equipping uh, uh, surgeons who are going through medical school with VR technology in order to make them better at their surgery. That way they don't actually have to practice on cadavers or I guess fake, uh, fake bodies. Um, and then I highlighted mental and physical therapy and mental therapy is very also close to phobia th uh, treatment, but that is kind of the area of where we are at right now. So here I've highlighted several companies that have actually done really, really great in the VR industry. Uh, Vivid Vision was actually here yesterday and they gave a presentation and they're one of the first companies to actually achieve FDA approval for their VR treatment. And this is huge when it comes to the healthcare industry. Um, FDA approval has been seen as one of the biggest hurdles uh, for physical therapists, or not physical therapists, for any sort of VR technology to enter the healthcare field. Uh, surgical theater is, very, is in, its, in its name, you have a surgery that you can simulate. Uh, and then also I highlighted uh, TMCX, which is a local uh, medical startup or medical accelerator here within Houston that has actually uh, accelerated uh, Physius. And Physius is a mental health, or Physis, which is a mental health uh, application. And uh, the Texas Medical Center is actually having uh, a big push for VR and AR applications. And that's kind of what they're searching for in the future for uh, the, who gets accelerated into their thing. In addition, there's an individual by the name of Billy Combe who has Billy's Playhouse, which is a Johnson & Johnson based uh, accelerator that is mainly meant for internal stuff, but it, they also have a VR division as well. So as you can see, VR is, is beginning to make its way into the healthcare industry, uh, slowly but surely, but those hurdles are definitely uh, some of the bigger ones to go through. So just a kind of a quick idea of how a VR application can have, or, or how a VR technology can be applied into healthcare. I've uh, gotten our presentation and I'll be uh, sharing that with you all today. 
So last year, I was driving to my sister's graduation uh, when suddenly the car directly in front of me stopped. <laughs> I slammed on my brakes, but when I looked in my rearview mirror, I could see that the truck behind me did not get the memo. Um, I woke up in a pool of shattered glass and smoke, unable to lift my right arm. I actually had a rotator cuff injury. It was then that I realized that I was going to have to go to a physical therapist to get better. Um, like many others who have been in a car accident, I required the aid of a physical therapist. And as some of you know, the road to recovery is not as easy as it sounds. I struggled going through therapy um, and because it was tedious and difficult to visualize my progress. I was feeling discouraged and every time that I considered skipping my sessions, I would think to myself that there had to be a better way. So my name, like I said, is Jonathan Avila and I'm a co-founder of Course Simulations. We, is, we are an early stage digital healthcare company that utilizes virtual reality to improve patient compliance and lower readmittance rates for physical therapy clinics. Um, our, our immersive solution also benefits the patients in therapy by transporting them to a new reality where we have curated and gamified their treatment to make their experience more enjoyable. So a bit of background on how we got to where we are now. We, are in the, we graduated from the Red Labs Accelerator uh, here within the University of Houston. We worked with Owlspark, and this is actually a, a class picture of us. And our next step is to hopefully get into that TMCX accelerator where we can be the second VR company to actually be accelerated through the medical center. So one of, oh my bad. So one of the biggest things to highlight is the problem that you're solving in VR. If you're not able to solve a problem that is going to be reimbursed by uh, either the insurance companies or the patients, then, or even a line item that you're able to uh, help out with, then you're not gonna be able to gain traction. So for us, the problem is that 70% of patients do not utilize all of their prescribed visits. And this is a problem for clinics because their revenue is directly associated with whether or not their patients are coming to their sessions. And if you were to add up all of our skip sessions or all of the skip sessions, the average clinic misses out on approximately $250,000 of revenue per, clinic, or per year. And this is where our solution comes in. So here you see a patient utilizing a virtual reality headset in their, with their therapy. Our software addresses the tedious nature of therapy by transporting them to a new reality where, like I said, where, uh, where we have gamified their treatment. For example, instead of stretching my rotator cuff 50 times like I did in therapy, I could be fighting off bad guys or painting in Paris. And as many of you all know, VR has the capability of kind of transporting you to any reality that you would like. So for example, uh, we can actually cater to different demographics of individuals by creating different forms of simulations that are more prone to be enjoyable and to be more engaging for those individuals. And so that's the Paris. <laughs> So the software can also collect positional data. And uh, positional data is very interesting because it's kind of one of the first times that we're collecting a form of data that we need to go through uh, particular HIPAA laws. And I'll explain HIPAA laws a little bit later and why they're kind of a pain in the, health, in the VR healthcare industry. Uh, but this positional data uh, can provide a, and well, so we collect the positional, positional data and we provide a comprehensive summary of treatment. Uh, this overview is valuable for clinics because uh, the, in the future we plan to make our assessment capable for reimbursement for insur insurance companies. In addition, this process will decrease the amount of time and labor spent on documentation. Currently, uh, physical therapists measure uh, all of the degrees, all of the rotations and reps by pen and paper for the most part. Uh, and so we're trying to automate all of that data into one uh, spreadsheet for, for the physicians, that way they can submit it out. So there are a handful of players in this VR therapy space who have validated the need for this solution. One of the biggest players is uh, VR Physio, and Recover actually doesn't really use virtual reality, and CoreSites is uh, overall a biofeedback uh, company. However, our true competition is the current methodologies that physical therapists use to measure the recovery rate of their patients. Uh, as you can see, pen and paper, uh, rulers, and uh, what's it called, goniometers are the most common forms of tools. Oh, and uh, we actually diversify ourselves from these competitions by implementing joint tracking with the HTC Vive Pucks. Uh, so currently, the, our competition just uses that controller and uh, is able to collect data that way, but we wanted to collect angle and positional data of the elbow to get a more accurate read on their, on their treatment. So our total addressable market will be the 120,000 physical therapy clinics that are in the United States. Uh, of those, we have identified 15,000 clinics that practice in the greater, uh, sorry, in that practice in Texas. And our final target market will be the 230 physical therapy clinics uh, in the United States. 
So luckily, Houston is known as the medical capital of the world and, I, well, is, and is home to some of the biggest names in physical therapy. Our team is looking to partner with research facilities like, like TIER, the Texas Institute of Rehab and Recovery, to validate the effectiveness of VR therapy. And kind of like on a note for, for clinics, uh, when approaching clinics in the, in the healthcare industry, it is probably best to get some accreditation with pilot technologies. And so our team is actually currently in the process of piloting our technology with a PT clinic in order to validate it for uh, bigger institutions like TIER. So Core Simulations plans to sell the VR hardware to physical therapy clinics for, uh, for in-clinic use. For the software, we are implementing an annual licensing model uh, with upgradable environments and exercises. And as VR technology advances, our team will develop an at-home uh, model so therapists can know if patients are attending or if patients are completing their prescribed exercises. For our go-to-market, we plan to pilot our technology uh, in specific clinics across Houston. And during this time, we'll be collecting data and reiterating the program. So this is the team that we currently have for core simulations. Um, and actually, what I would recommend if anyone here is interested in starting their own healthcare uh, company is to make sure that you have some form of a physician uh, with your team. And we ran into that issue very early on to where we had a lot of students and a lot of, uh, well, we had business and development experience, but we did not have an actual physical therapist on the team in order to advise us. Recently, we have changed that and we are pursuing to, and with our pilot technology, have a much closer relationship with the physical therapist. So this is where we're at now. Over the course of the summer, we've been able to build eight VR simulations and they focus on range of motion and daily functional activities. Uh, so today, we are actually in the process of talking to rehabilitation facilities for those pilots, and also good old FDA approval, which, like I said, is one of the biggest hurdles in healthcare. Um, so with that process, I would like to actually highlight the aspect of analytics. I said earlier, like through the market research, I've identified that this form of analytics being sent from physician to patient is becoming more and more prevalent, and they're actually trying to discover different ways of collecting data from patients. Um, in the future, they're actually hoping to have what's called a fee for service as opposed uh, as opposed. Okay, so fee for service. No, sorry, fee for value as opposed to fee for service. Fee for service is basically if I'm a physician, I can kind of like be a mill and just run patients through my clinic. But a fee for value is that my reimbursement as a physician is actually dependent on how well my patients are doing after their therapy. The only issue is that it's hard to track to see how well they're going because positional data is in a way hard to track, but we're trying to solve that issue with virtual reality, with the positional tracking. So a lot of different companies kind of go at it at two different ways. Uh, they either go where they try to help the patients directly or they try to go to the clinic to where they can actually provide the technology to a physician where they then administer it to patients. And we're trying to explore both avenues of, that, of those opportunities. Um, but it's kind of, it depends on what your product is, because I've seen products oriented and marketed towards physicians and oriented and marketed towards patients. Um, and actually FDA kind of has a different rule on both of those. If you're working with patients, you're gonna to have to go through FDA approval, and if you're collecting any patient data, you're gonna to have to go through HIPAA laws. As opposed to going through physicians, it, it works a little bit differently to where the, the FDA is not gonna be as strenuous if your product is for the physicians. Oh, in addition, uh, what is it called? Our process, uh, it improves patient engagement, and these are just general uh, VR improvements for healthcare. Uh, you can improve patient engagement if it is for patient, increase, increase the quality of life, definitely increase the form of data collection, and also increase uh, patient neuroplasticity. So I've done a lot of research on different, and this is just kind of like specifically for our case study, in this case for core simulations. Uh, if you go online to do a lot of different uh, research, you can find that many different, uh, what is it called? Research, or not research, many different uh, individuals have pursued this kind of virtual reality form of treatment. But there's been only a few companies that have actually came out of it. Here you can see that virtual reality can improve uh, stroke for patients. Um, it actually can improve uh, complex walking and reduce fall risks for patients with Parkinson's disease. And it can uh, help with upper limb motor functions, which is actually what we're trying to work on for stroke and, and uh, Parkinson's. And finally, uh, it has stroke and rehabilitation for implications for clinics. So a lot of information, a lot of research has been going into this form of, uh, what is it called? 
into this new form, this new application for healthcare. So the FDA approval process is quite long, and I'm actually just gonna go step by step as to what you should kind of like look out for. So the first step is device discovery and concept. You have to understand what type of device you are offering for patients and physicians. And this is, can be classified from class one through three. Um, class one is the most minimal form of a device. It's basically uh, a stick that you can put in your tongue for a doctor to check your throat. Uh, class two, you get a little bit more complicated where the, uh, the treatment is a little bit more invasive. And for this instance, uh, we've actually been not necessarily classified, but we believe our classification may be class two if we decide to go through the FDA route. And then class three is actually inside the human body where it does change uh, some, some form of uh, biological or chemical processes. And class three are some of the hardest ones to get approved because they take so much time in order to uh, get those processes done. So step two is preclinical research and prototype. Uh, so this is for specifically, if you want to go in a new avenue for healthcare, you have to do your own clinical research. Um, however, there's a way that you can actually get around that process by going through 510K exemption, uh, which I've highlighted in the second uh, approval. 510K exemption means that if there's already a pre uh, pre, pre device on the market that meets the same qualifications that you can reach, uh, you can just file for 510K and then you can, I guess, fast track the whole FDA process and actually skip step two, which is a preclinical trials. Uh, so the preclinical trials can actually take a lot of uh, capital and a lot of time and so anything that can do that, that fast track it would be recommended. Step four is after you have your 510K exemption and after you already send it in for uh, approval, the FDA reviews um, and they file for a pre-market notification. And if they can approve it, and if they do approve it, then you go into step five, uh, which is post-market safety monitoring, which is basically FDA comes in, make sure that all the technology is right, make sure it's helping the right people and make sure it's achieving the same claims that you've uh, ad that you've written down on your FDA uh, process. So these are some new integrations in uh, VR technology. You have Neurable, which is actually one of our favorites and we're hoping to get a dev kit in the next upcoming months. And Neurable is basically combining a virtual reality headset with an EEG, so where you can read brain activity. And we're hoping to use this actually in stroke patients in order to get them to uh, be able to move their arm or at least get the process, uh, what is it called? redundant enough to where they actually have that ability to move the arm. Uh, the Steam VR Tracking 2.0, one of the biggest issues we currently run into is that if this puck is not tracked correctly, um, then it can actually mess up with the data collected. And so uh, 2.0 tracking, we're hoping that can be better sensors and also a bigger area. Uh, and then, like I said, the Vive Positional Trackers, we really want to use these as points of reference for angles and for repetitions and everything. So, uh, actually, Challenges in the future. Actually, I had this slide here, um, but I didn't put the text in there. So I'm gonna really quickly talk about grants. Okay, hold on one second. Uh, okay, so grant funding. Um, a lot of startups who are in this area, they need to, the whole FDA process and going through counseling and things like that requires a fair bit of capital behind uh, to, to support. So I highly recommend that if you are interested in going down the FDA, or not the FDA route, but into healthcare, you look into the SBIR and STTR grants. And if you can achieve, uh, and these are two examples of two grants that not necessarily that we've achieved in, in one, but, or that we've been awarded, but ones that we are, what is it called, uh, keeping in mind for the future to apply for. And these, these grants actually do take a, a big amount of time and effort to also create as well. Uh, so we have uh, StrokeNet Small Business Innovation for Clinical Trials, and uh, we also have another uh, stroke-related grant. It doesn't say it there, but this is actually a non-STTR and SBIR. Actually, the, the ones that are non-STTR are actually a lot harder because larger uh, companies can actually come in and apply for, which they have the capital and the, the labor needed in order to write all those things. Um, so that's the end, but there was one part I wanted to make sure I mentioned. Let me just bring up the notes here. And it was the challenges that uh, companies going down the healthcare route will most likely face. Uh, so governmental regulation. As providers of healthcare services, uh, and this is specifically for physical therapy, uh, physical therapists are subject to various regulations from federal, state, and local government bodies. Uh, government involvement 
uh, in healthcare has been increasing in the public eye in recent years. Therefore, intensifying pressure for new legislation that has potential to change the industry environment. And this is also specifically for software in our case as well, and also in all case for VR. Um, in the future, HIPAA laws may cause many restrictions on the service, which would affect how products uh, functions with clinics. Another thing is the adoption of PT training. Uh, since virtual reality is an emerging industry, it will take some time for the technology to be completed, completely adopted by the public. Uh, virtual reality requires uh, a different software and hardware to operate the traditional models. Um, users of this technology will, be, will need to be properly trained. In this case, we're for physical therapists, they have what's called a physical therapy assistant. We would actually have to be training the physical therapy assistants in order to know how to use this technology in order to administer it. So there is a form of training that needs to be done with those particular uh, types of physicians. In addition, adequate funding. One of the biggest things for any healthcare uh, company is making sure that you have enough money in order to pay for the FDA consulting as well as the uh, what's called grant writers if you're planning to go for grants. And all of those have a very hefty cost on, on a, any form of startup. And so, uh, so yeah, uh, this is, that is basically the consensus of our, at least our journey within uh, healthcare and VR and kind of like some of the upcoming hurdles that we plan to see and also how we're planning to implement it and apply it uh, for the healthcare industry. Uh, with that, I, I thank you guys for coming out and for this session. And uh, are there any questions by chance? <laughs>